right? Whatever, whatever sonship means for us, whatever responsibility it is he wants to pour into us. Um, and so I think that's kind of a neat way to think about it in, in your own life, you know, that, um, and some people never get there. Just because you are this doesn't mean you become this in this life. Although, uh, Paul has an entire discussion kind of about this, um, where he's, he's dealing with putting on the new body, right? Um, let me see where that is. Um, it's Romans chapter 8. And so, I think the idea is that, that we have been born in the Spirit. And so, there is a spiritual timetable of these things, right? That, so, now if we're talking about being trustworthy, it is, it is a, a character thing. It's an internal thing. It's a spirit thing, right, of who you are on the inside. In Romans chapter 8, Paul is saying, though, that the full manifestation of being a son is when the Lord gives you a new body as well, right? That part of your future role, part of your future responsibility, he says, we, we now have, in Galatians 4, he talks about um, that because we've been adopted in, we have received the spirit of the son, right? So that ought to take on a little more meaning for you now that you have been adopted in and you have received the spirit of the son. Not just the spirit of a child, but the spirit of a son, right? Talking about the, the honored son, Jesus. You have received the spirit of this on the inside, uh, who cries out, Abba, Father, right? So in other words, he's saying, you have received the spirit of the one who is this, who is, who is uh, the down payment of what you will receive Later, he says, the spirit that you receive is the down payment. And in Romans 8, he's talking about that there is a future glory still to come for the sons where the full manifestation is not just the spirit that is inside, but you will receive a new body as part of your adoption as sons. Right. So part of becoming this in the new heaven and the new earth is the body as well. That, that it, it, we can't be the mature sons of God with this old sinful flesh. That part of being the honored son that he has destined us to become is putting on a new body. Right? And so that's what he's talking about here in Romans um, chapter 8. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have the, received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. I think part of that suffering with him so that we may be glorified with him captures this image of the 17 years of, of sitting under the Father's feet and, and just learning and not having the responsibility. You're, you're learning what the Father wants you to learn. Because how do we learn often in these 17 years? It's through lack. or Just like the Israelites in the wilderness. They didn't have things and they saw God provide. God's, uh, God's classroom is often uh, begins with the wilderness time. Right? Did with Paul. Paul said he went to Arabia where the mountain of God was. Right? Which is, you know, Midian, the desert, where, where they received the Ten Commandments. Paul says that's where he went. And he spent time there. Um, and so... Uh, often the, the training uh, is, is challenging, right? Because the Lord is trying to prepare you. Uh, and you know what they called this 17-year period? They called it the time of discipline. Right? The time of discipline. So when he, that, that should add a little meaning when he says, uh, he whom the Father loves, he disciplines. Right? And no discipline is pleasant at the time, but it is, it is profitable for you. Right? Uh, and so... Uh, so that all kind of wraps together with that. He says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. I think this, this kind of period of training where you're learning the Father's business and then you become this, I think it has application for daily life that, that there is a period where we go through with this and then the Father trusts us with the responsibility. But like so many things in the Word, I think there's also a bigger application of it, right? 
which is our life in general is like this 17 year period and then the resurrection is the full weight of what it means to become a son right so Paul in some places talks about becoming this now like growing into maturity now but then in this Romans chapter 8 he's talking about this as being the resurrection right the the uh, he says, for I consider the sufferings of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Right? So this is what he's talking about. For the revealing of the sons of God. He says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hoped that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So he's saying even the creation that, that, is, that is in um, futility is, is giving birth uh, to something new. Right? And he says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Right? So in other words, like I was saying, we have the Spirit of the Son, but not the fullness of it yet. So he says, the Spirit groans inwardly in us as we wait eagerly for the, for the uh, adoption as sons, which is the redemption of our body. Right? And so he's saying, we have now the Spirit of the Son who is inwardly waiting for our bodies to catch up with the maturity of the Spirit. Right? And so... Uh, that we have received the spirit of the Son, of someone that he can trust, right? But we have not yet received the fullness of it. And so he's saying while we're here on earth, we, we moan inwardly because, and, and, and this is part of, I think, the, the, Paul talks so much about the, the difference between spirit and flesh and how they're at war with one another. So he says, part of me wants to do well, but then my flesh is there and it hinders me, right? And so, uh, so I think this is, is part of this whole concept that we are called to be sons that he can trust, that he can, uh, that he can look at. I almost think if you went back in and looked at the length of Joseph's slavery period, it was about this long before he became the trusted son to oversee the father's business. Because really, he was not doing Pharaoh's business, although there's that image too. He was really doing God's business, and that's what he told his brothers, that the Lord sent me here ahead of you to prepare a place for you. Right. Um, so he was, he was given his responsibility at age, age 30, I believe, also. But yeah, it was, it was definitely age 30 because he, he ruled for 80 more years before he died at 110. So he was uh, raised at 30 years also. Uh, and in fact, there's a Levitical law that says that, uh, I believe it's the priest or something, that there's a difference at 30 years old. Um, that they, they had certain responsibilities that they couldn't do until they were a certain age. Um, and so this is kind of a neat concept that God is trying to mature us. And so I think there's two levels of understanding here. One is that in the course of our earthly life, we will go through a period where he will train and prepare us so that we can be a trusted son in this life. But that is not the fullness of this concept of being a trusted son because Paul says the real fullness of that doesn't come until he also gives you the resurrected body to go with the spirit you have received on the inside. And at that point, you are the adopted son. This is what he means. It doesn't just mean, he's not saying that the redemption of your body is when you become part of Christ. That's not, you know, like when you're saved because he says the, the adoption as sons, which is the redemption of your body. So clearly... This is not our, our standard thought of adoption, where, where you adopt someone into your family. What he's, he's using this as this word of maturity, and he's saying it's that point when you receive your new body that you can begin to do this. Right? And this is when, um, and Christ modeled this, that, that he began to operate on the Father's behalf after this period, and he began to... Uh, to do whatever the Father, you know, whatever he saw the Father do. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
right? Isn't that the sign of the trusted son, right? That if, if I've learned so much from my father that if you see me doing it, I'm doing it the way he would have done it because I've learned from him, right? And so I think this is part of our training now is that we are learning from the Lord Jesus how he would have us live and that he has a responsibility that he wants to put into all of our lives, but it comes uh, by submitting to obedience. And so it almost appears like what they're saying is that if you are, if you are this, at the resurrection, Christ is going to make you this, right? But there is the walk of obedience now in this life that not everyone who is born of God reaches a place of maturity in the kingdom in this life, right? That, that it's not, you don't always become mature in the Lord in this life, but at the resurrection, all things are made new and you will be by the resurrection. Yeah. What would you mean, uh, <clears throat> difference that people that would reach this in this life, like when uh, when Jesus talked about put you in charge of five kingdoms, would yeah. there be a difference in, in, in the next life? It could be. That's kind of an interesting thought because that that is a scripture that came to my mind too when I was thinking about this because this because this does mean responsibility. And, and what I'm going to entrust you with. And in fact, Jesus says in many of his parables, I'm watching how you handle this stuff, right? Uh, and in one of his parables, the master is watching, and he says, um, you know, because you've been faithful, uh, you know, I'll put you in charge of ten cities. And this one, because he was faithful, I'll put you in charge of five cities or whatever. And so it, it almost seems that there is a... a um, that he's watching, yeah, that there's a connection between... Um, you know, in some ways, Jesus teaches that everything's going to be the same. He says, you know, you got one person started at this time and another person started this time, they get the same wage. But then in other places, he says, if you were faithful on this, then I'm going to bless you like this. And the other person was faithful with a little bit, and so I'm going to bless them in a slightly different way. So I don't know, um, you know, the, the only other thing is if, you know, some of those ones where he's talking about responsibility, um, if he's talking about this life. You know, and not just talking about the eternal life. But Paul makes an interesting statement. He says, don't you know that, I think it was Paul or Peter, might have been Peter, he says, don't you know that you're to judge the angels? Right? Uh, which is an interesting thought. And so sometimes I think we, we think of judge, and so that's good for this, this quarter because we're in the judges class, that when we think of judging the angels, if, if you haven't thought through the biblical concept of that, when you think of judging the angels, you might think of a courtroom, right? Where we decide whether they're right or wrong. But in the judge's class, the judge was not necessarily one that decided right or wrong. It was one that had authority over that group, right? That had the responsibility, that God entrusted with the responsibility of the management of that tribe, right? And so it was not just like a courtroom, either you're right or you're wrong, although they did some of that. It was really about responsibility and leadership, right? And so when he says, don't you know that you'll judge the angels? And then he starts talking about your joint heirs with Christ. Um, it makes you wonder is, is you know, when, when we receive our new bodies, what level of responsibility, you know, will he give us? You know, that, that there's a whole eternity ahead of us. And so who knows what levels of responsibility we actually have. But I think all of that concept is connected back to this that there is a difference between just being a child and being a trusted son. Um, but Paul says that at the redemption of our bodies, this is where we'll be. So I, I believe that, that what he's saying is, is no matter what, as long as you have been redeemed, that when the resurrection comes and he creates a new heaven and a new earth, uh, there will be some level of, of you know, responsibility given to you, you know, because you made it into the kingdom now. Uh, he says other things. Uh, there's one place where Paul talks about making it in as one who passed through the fire, right? It just, just barely made it in, right? Um, as if to say that there might not be much of a reward for that person, you know? Um, so it, it's not 100% clear. I think, it, to me, the, what, what I really think it is, is when he says that they each receive the same thing, he's talking about eternal life with him. But that doesn't mean that everyone's eternal life is exactly the same either. Just like when he first created us, he didn't create everyone to do the exact same things. He created everyone with different 
responsibilities, different jobs. Every animal is different. Many different animals have different uh, things that they do in the natural scheme of keeping the kingdom in order. All angels are not the same, right? Um, and so it would make you think then that, that probably uh, there will be differentiations in some respect in the kingdom, right? Um, but to what extent is hard to know, right? All right, how much time do we have? Not much. Let me see if I can... Uh, let's go to Galatians 4, chapter 1. And so keeping this kind of concept in mind, you know, that he's saying there's a difference between a child and an heir. You know, that, uh, that, that's the whole point here is he's saying there's a difference between a child and an heir. Right? That's what Galatians 4 is about. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he's the owner of everything. So in other words, he's saying you could be here, born of God, but not yet mature enough to walk in everything that you actually genuinely have. Because the moment you are born of God, you have everything. The Bible even talks about that. All things are yours. Romans chapter 8. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can walk in it if you are still a child. right? If you have not reached the level of maturity. Or ultimately, we have not been redeemed through the resurrection. And so we can't fully walk in his responsibility. But Galatians 4.1, he says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave. Though he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. Right? until the date set by his father. He says, In the same way also, when we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, his son, right? So whenever you think of Jesus as being the son, you should think of this concept, the trusted son. That is what we're trying to become, is like Jesus in that way, the trusted son. Uh, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, right? This concept of being the mature son. He sent Jesus so that we could also be mature sons. And because you are sons, God has spent the, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And so there's some interesting things in the Bible uh, you know, that deal with what it means uh, to be a son, right? Let me give you, uh, just in, in keeping with this idea that Jesus is more than a child, he is the son, right? So I, I guess that's what I want you to think of, is that sonship is, is not just you are part of the family. Sonship is that you are the trustworthy, responsible son. Isaiah 9, 6, we quote it all the time, at Christmas, um, it says, uh, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, right? So I think it's kind of interesting. He, he, he repeats himself. He says, a child is born, right? But then he says, but really a son was given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulders, right? And so that's, I think he's drawing... When he's just saying a son, he's not just using another synonym for child. He's saying a son has been given to us. And not just any son, but, but this kind of son. Because the government will be upon his shoulders. He'll be called Mighty Counselor, Everlasting Father. I think that's an interesting thing. That, that the son was to be so associated with the father uh, that, that he's even called Everlasting Father. He says there'll be a son that's given to you who will even be called Everlasting Father. Uh, which is kind of an interesting concept. And, uh, but throughout it all, uh, it's listing all of the things that what Jesus' sonship means. That he's the, the mighty God, the eternal one, the counselor, the prince of peace. You know, that's what his responsibility is. What his role as a son is. So unto us a child is given. Unto us a child is born. But unto us a son is given. Right? And so it's kind of an interesting thought. Unto us a child is born, but it's more than that. Because unto us a son is given. This, this type of son that is the responsible one. Alright. Um, let me see here if I've got anything else.
Hebrews 2.10 is another interesting one. And I'm going to get you guys out of here in about two minutes. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. So keep in mind that these sons are perfected through this period of learning. And, and, and you know, it, it's not a fun learning always. You know, the, the being the apprentice is not the fun thing. That's the part where you make all the mistakes and you have to suffer a little while and you have to, it's hard. And, and you know, in, in, in real life, our period there, maybe the Lord has you do without. Or maybe as you lead something that's small or maybe as you get a sickness or, you know, Something like that. I don't think the Lord gives us sickness, but He allows us to go through different things that cause us to depend on Him, right? And so, just like they went through the wilderness and they had different uh, needs, they had people that attacked them, they had hunger, they had need for water. That that God provided all of those, but there was a moment where they had to at least become aware of their need, right? And so that's often what this period is like. Is it can be a struggling period, right? Joseph was in prison, but he was learning, right? He learned humility through the time that he suffered, right? And then he became 30, and he was, he was exalted quickly to his position. So keeping all of that in mind, Hebrews 2.10 says, For it was fitting that he whom by all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. He says God's going to bring many sons to into glory. He's going to produce many of these sons who have gone through their period of, of trusting and trial and development. And he says, isn't it fitting then that the captain of all of these sons also was made perfect through suffering? So in other words, he's saying that we will be made perfect through many of these trials and lessons that we go through. And he's saying if Jesus is the head son, how fitting was it that he also has this testimony that he was made perfect through these things. Right. So in other words, if, if all of the rest of us sons are made sons through this type of stuff, Jesus himself, even though he didn't really need it, but Hebrews author is just kind of saying, isn't that fitting? That if this is what it takes to become a son, that even Jesus, who didn't really need to do that, also himself joined with us in that to become perfect through his own period of growth and development during this time. Right. Yeah. Right. He says, I'll refine you in a refiner's fire, is what he says. I believe that's Isaiah. He says, I'll refine you as in a refiner's fire. All right. So in other words, the way you start is not here. Right? This, is, this is a mature thing that I will bring you into. Right? Um, and so I think it's kind of uh, a neat concept to go back in and study with this concept in mind. That when he's saying son... There is, there is differentiation between child and son. That, that there are many in the kingdom, uh, but not everyone in the kingdom has been obedient enough to be entrusted with the responsibility. Okay. All right, I think that's it. We'll go ahead and close down for now. Um, but that's a good one. I may preach on that one day, so... No, I'm just kidding. I don't know if I could preach on that. I might be able to. Sometimes some things are better for teaching and some things are better for preaching, you know. And um, so. I think if you had that, you know, over there, this would have to be just maybe like a point, you know, and then preach on some other things. But, uh, all right, well, if I do preach on it, just nod and pretend that it was good. First time you heard it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you. <laughs>